One, two, one, two. It works. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the project, the Playboy of the Music, uh, Playboy of the West Indies, the musical. Um, first of all, the play uh, came into existence sometime in the early 80s when Nick Kent, the producer, director, um, was uh, at the time in Oxford, and he commissioned the play from Mustafa, and it was first produced, I think, in, at the Oxford Playhouse. Nick is here, as is Mustafa's wife, Ingrid. Lovely to see you all. So Playboy had great success as a play throughout the UK and the United States between the 80s, 90s, and up to fairly recently, I think. And then a few years ago, um, Nick got together with Mustafa and they were having a rethink about the play and they thought, what about if we made, we added some songs, we made it into a musical. So then two composers were brought on board. Mustafa suggested one composer who was me and Nick suggested another composer that he had worked with uh, on a pr another production, Clement Ishmael. And so they brought both of us together and together we wrote a whole bunch of songs working with Mustafa and Nick, turning the play into a kind of hybrid play musical. So the end result is a, a, a piece that has about 22 songs uh, with lyrics that we all worked on. We spent about four years working on it, just constantly sort of trimming, tweaking, writing, rewriting, and so on. We also did a workshop at the National Theatre Studio in 2018. Uh, we were supposed to go into production in 2020, I think, and of course COVID put a halt to that. Anyhow, we were really lucky to get a production on in June of 2022 um, in Birmingham, at the Birmingham Rep. And, uh, and now we're going to play, Glian played the role of Peggy and the actor <clears throat> who played the main role of the playboy, Ken, is actually with us here tonight, Jerome. <laughs> so we're going to do, we're going to give you two songs that I wrote. Um, they're two ballads, so uh, Leanne will interpret them for you and she'll tell you a little bit about her impressions of playing Peggy. First song is called um, This Is Not the Life I Dreamed Of. Serving shots in a dusty rum shop, listening to old men night and day. Telling their stories as they sway Cleaning up my father's mess Never knowing happiness So I look to where the sky is blue And the breeze is tickling the sea I try to make a picture of who life for something true to who I want to be. I want to see the world outside, go to town, take a steam train ride, see the hills of San Fernando, Climb the heights of Mount Aripo Take a walk through the marketplace Feast myself on all I can taste I want to learn, I want to read books That I know will lead to that life I try to dream of with friends I can speak of, friends to laugh with every day. To 
to share the troubles that come our way. So I look to where the sky is blue and the breeze is tickling the sea. I try to make a picture of who will share a dream with me and leave this life for something true. So the next song um, comes in the second act of the play, and it's Leanne's character, Peggy, who's telling her beau, Stanley, that she's not really too interested in his version of life, which is really about go-getting, making as much money as possible. And she tells him exactly the sort of things that make her life happy and make her happy. This one is called Green Mango. I go get my wonder from Green mango cheeks turning red Scarlet ibis at sunset Blazing home, having fed Kids out at dusk, frogs serenading sings, golden rays of sun that the morning brings. See the hummingbirds flutter on their wings, all for free. Stanley, Stanley. don't really want to own no property Stanley maybe you need a hybrid mulatto to make you manly Stanley riding sideways on she filly a lady Stanley it's my wonder from green mango, green mango. <laughs> and um, I just wanted uh, to ask Leanne to share some of her impressions of playing the role of Peggy and what she felt that she learned about Trinidad in the 50s for a young woman. Wow. <laughs> um, well, first of all, it was an absolute honor to get to play Peggy and to work with such an amazing team. Um, and playing Peggy gave me quite a few realizations. So on one hand, it showed me how much more simple life is in Trinidad, how happy, you know, liming on the beach with your friends, with your family, and there's a bigger sense of community, I think, than there is now. Um, a, a more sense of freedom on one hand. Um, but saying that also on the other hand, I would also say that playing Peggy showed me how women in the 50s um, in Trinidad and in the Caribbean also lacked a lot of freedom. Um, so in the show, Peggy has kind of her whole life kind of set out for her already. She has her job decided for her. She has who she's gonna marry decided for her. Um, and I think, you know, when this mysterious guy comes into the town and shakes things up a little bit, it uh, tantalizes her and gives her the opportunity to make a decision for herself on her own life. Um, so I guess for me as Glianne, uh, what Peggy has kind of has kind of taught me um, is to be bold, uh, to be brave, and to give myself permission to take risks. 
um, because in taking the risks, risks are really scary, but in those scary moments is where you learn most about yourself, I believe, and um, I believe that's the same for Peggy in the show. Um, yeah, and then to trust yourself. So I think that's what I've kind of learned from playing Peggy. Yeah. That's, um, it, it's very pertinent actually that you talk about taking risks because about a week before we were due to open the show, the actor who was due to play the lead role of Peggy had a health problem, got ill, and Glian, who was understudying the role, stepped in within, with just one week's notice and suddenly found herself propelled <laughs> into the lead role. And she held that role with absolute mastery. So congratulations you. to you. And while we've been singing, you'll be seeing uh, some of the photos some of the production photos from the show in Birmingham. So um, that's us done for <laughs> Playboy. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. And of course, we've got the Bocas team in, in our midst. You've had a long day, I know, of various panel discussions, exploring 
the concept of home, imagination. You've just been orchestrated by um, Randolph Matthews. You've been a cappella. Not only a cappella, you've been orchestrated. Now, Melanie, as you know, is the founder of the um, Renaissance One, an organization that motivates and brings to light of the public not only the written word, but the spoken word. Because as you know, bocas from the Spanish meaning mouth. I love that idea, the mouth. We celebrate both the page and the mouth. And of course, what I think for this type of audience will be very important is if I could inflict upon you a little um, linguistic diversion. By the way, I know the acoustics is not brilliant, even though it's the British Museum, but since I'm a very politically correct man, I wouldn't say the acoustics is bad. Let us say it is sonically challenged. <laughs> All right? According to the linguists, when British soldiers were in, based in Trinidad and they associate lime as a cure for scurvy, they got the nickname Limeys. And I gather from my linguistic friends, they were seen liming or loitering outside of brothels. That was the reality. Hence the name liming. But when we speak of liming in the Caribbean, and Melanie has been initiating evenings of liming, liming isn't a case of doing nothing. It's a case of human beings exchanging ideas, arguing about politics, arguing about cricket, touching their frail selves, exposing their egos. You might say a limer. We say it in Guyana as well, liming. So within that, shall we say, psychic context, and having been orchestrated by Randolph, we can afford to lime. But I want to take you back even further I want to take you back to the mosquitoes that saw Columbus on his arrival. And this is what the mosquitoes have to say. <laughs> we mosquitoes, we don't like to boast. We consider ourselves these island hosts. We are original colonists, not by sword, by proboscis. We've been around for millions of years, and we ain't going nowhere, have no fear. The ancient Egyptians tried fishing net. They tried frankincense. We ain't extinct yet. Join in this mosquito chorus. Buzz like you is one of us. Buzz, buzz, buzz. Let me hear you people. Enter the mood of the mosquito. Line by line after me. Let me hear you. Join in this mosquito chorus. You can do better than that. I know you had a long day. But you know. The limer's got a lot of energy. Let me hear you. Give it to the British Museum. Suck it to me. Join in this mosquito chorus. Buzz, buzz, buzz. Buzz, buzz, buzz. Buzz like you is one of us. Buzz like you is one of us. We like to bite democratically. Black, white, brown, we bite equally. We don't agree with discrimination. We bite every pigmentation. <laughs> no, we mosquitoes, not prejudice. You could be a mister, you could be a miss. One drop of blood is all we ask. We ain't asking for a thermos flask. <laughs> Hear me, people. Join in this mosquito chorus. Let me hear you buzz like you is one of us. Buzz, buzz, buzz. Buzz, buzz, buzz. Join the mosquito chorus. 
Buzz like you is one of us. Mosquito biting high. Mosquito biting low. From your head down to your Tobago. Mosquito biting high. Mosquito biting low. From your armpit to your archipelago. <laughs> Dinosaur, dodo, and them gone to a place called oblivion. So we say, bring on the pesticide. We mosquitoes have God on we side. Buzz, 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 buzz like you is one of us. Buzz, 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 buzz like you is one of us. Thank you very much, thank you. Yay. Give it up for John Agard. Now we have a special treat in the liming mode. How many of us have experienced Juve in Trinidad? Okay. So some of you will be aware that there's a remarkable poem called Sunrise by Grace Nichols, and we're about to experience an extract of it. So please give a very warm welcome to Grace Nichols. Thank you, everyone. It's been a really lovely festival. And I've noticed today so many carnivalesque type figures around and, and the lovely hummingbirds. So I thought I'd do this extract from a long poem I wrote on a carnival. It's called Sunris, from, from a book of poems that I wrote called Sunris. And uh, it's a woman's journey through carnival. Uh, in which she reclaims all the different strands of her heritage. And uh, at the end of this long journey, she calls herself the mythic name Sunris, a combination of the sun and the, the, the goddess uh, Iris, who is the rainbow goddess connecting both heaven and earth. So she names herself Sunris. And this little extract uh, from Walcott, Derek, Derek Walcott, our Nobel laureate always struck me. He said, carnival is all that is claimed for it. It is exaltation of the mass will. Its hedonism is so sacred that to withdraw from it, not to jump up, to be contemplative outside of its frenzy is a heresy. So I love that comment. And it's just a short extract from, from this poem. I did it at the National Theater a long time ago in which uh, I was accompanied by a steel band, a steel pan playing in the background. Out of the four day morning, they come in. Out of the little houses clinging to the hillside, they come in. Out of the big house and the hovel, they come in to lift up this city to the sun, to incarnate their own carnation. Symbol of the emancipated woman I come. I don't care which one from. From the depths of the unconscious I come. I come out to play mass woman. This mass I put on? is not to hide me. This mass I put on is visionary, a combination of the right sightful sun, a belly band with all my strands, a plume of scarlet ibis, a branch of hope and a snake in my fist. Join me in this pilgrimage, this spree that look like sacrilege. 
And it's the whole island awash in a deep sea song. It's hummingbird possession taking flight from the ground. It's blood beating and spirit moving free. It's promiscuous wine, it's sanctity. Hands, hands, is all a matter of hands. Through the shaping and the cutting, through the stitching and the touching, through the bright door of love, come the splendor of hands. Feet, feet, is all a matter of feet. For the spirits take entry from the feet. High priestess and devil, Aztec king and me, midnight robber, Saint Teresa, all carried by the rise and fall, the rise and fall, the trance, unstoppable rhythm, and death, mingling free in his white wing beats. We ain't stopping till Ash Wednesday puts a kick in we heels. Father, forgive us, for we know not. Forgive the man who just placed his hand on my promised land. Later, he will take the ash and close his eye. Man born of woman, you're born to die. Spirit, preserve my harvest from their fat choose the eyes. And is the whole island awash in a deep sea sound? Is hummingbird possession taking flight from the ground? Is blood beating and spirit moving free? Is promiscuous wine? Is sanctity? Oh, history is a river that flow to the sea, laced with the bone of memory. I riding high her choreography. I paying homage in ceremony. Thank you. Thank you. Special, special thanks to Grace Nichols for her beautiful poem. Before we go into the next um, artist that I'd like to introduce, um, all of you here in this space is testament to the Bocas Festival. And I'd like to give some thanks because many of you have been here all day. And thanks so much for your warmth and generosity throughout the day. I'd like to give a special thanks to the British Library team, in particular, Jonah Albert, B, and Nicole Rochelle Moore as well as many of the other team behind the scenes that have made th this happen. Yeah, so let's please give them um, some applause. And also the Renaissance One team. There's six members of the team that have been around throughout the day, selling books and being around. And then to the wonderful Bocas Festival. There's, they're, they're large in number, but in particular, I'd like to give a big shout out to Marina Salandi Brown, who created Bocas Festival. Yeah. To Nicholas Laughlin to Shivani Ramlachan, to Lucy Hanna, their chair as well, and to all of the Bocas team that have worked tirelessly for today. And also, you've been experiencing the many um, costumes and this sense of mass and carnival within the space. So, Clary Salandi, please give it up for Clary Salandi and Mahogany and her team as well. So now we're moving on to another form of liming, um, and it's my pleasure to be introducing Fred Degar, who's currently over here from Los Angeles on a UK tour. And many of us have been experience his, experiencing not just his words and his poetry, but also his recent memoir, Year of Plagues. So please give a very warm welcome to Fred Degar. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Good evening. Yes. 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 Since both Grace and John are Guyanese, and both Grace and John have won the Queen's Medal for Poetry, and I'm Guyanese. Maybe I get the kings. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, I have two short poems for you. And um, <clears throat> I'm only going to do them because one of them, which I wrote in the 80s, I know I was alive, 
it's on the O-level list. And so if anybody in the audience is doing an O-level, I'm going to give you the secrets. You hear? I'm going to give you the secrets for the poem. It's a poem called Papati. And it's, um, when, when I, I grew up in Guyana, I was born in London. When I was two, my parents posted us back to Guyana for a proper upbringing. And then I came back here after 10 and a half years in Guyana, came back to London. And my granddad, on my mom's side, was a merchant seaman. And when he went away, he would learn a poem from the Palgrave Treasury. In that was Tennyson's Charge of the Light Brigade, which he memorized. When he came back, he sat us all down, just a bit like you are here, a captive audience. You don't realize it. If you try and leave and see what will happen. No, 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 I'm joking, you can leave. But what would happen is he would begin to do Tennyson from memory. And we'd all be fidgeting because we were speaking Caribbean Creole Guyanese. He's doing a Victorian poem. You can imagine the translation that's necessary. But one thing he would do is if you interrupted him, he would stop and tell you off in Creole. And then he would go back to the poem and continue in Victorian English, which we thought was miraculous. If he was really mad with you for interrupting him, he would start the poem from the top all over again. And then afterwards, we'd jump the person and beat them up for... Um, so what you're going to hear is exactly what I've just told you. I've just given away the entire poem. But you're going to hear it in a kind of English pentameter, which I was trying to emulate. Papa T. When Grandad recited the Tennyson learned at sea, I saw... Companies of redcoats tin soldiering it through rugged country, picked off one by one by poison tipped blow darts or arrows from nowhere. Their drums panicky rattle, their buglers yelp, musket clap, and popping cannons smoke everywhere. Grandad would cut short to shout, If y'all don't pay me mind, I'm going to give you a good looking and send you to bed. Resuming as he breathed in, his consonants stretched past recall into a whale's crying place, beginning polyp kingdoms shipwrecked into Amerindian care for months. We'd sit tight, all eyes on our sweet sea salter, for that last line sound someone mistimed once, making him start again. These days, the perfect lined face of a blank page startles at first, like Papa T's no-nonsense recitals, it has me itching to bring him reeling off in that tongue. On uh, the charge they made, on uh, the light brigade, noble 600, to hear, to disobey. And then the last poem, no, not the last, but you know, my last contribution tonight, I'm, I'm gonna keep writing poetry, <laughs> whether you like it or not. Actually, you know, for this one, it's called Mandela. And it's about what Mandela meant to me and all of us who were um, active in, in anti-apartheid before it happened, and anyway, when he was released, the kind of meaning of it. Um, but I needed audience participation. Not very much. You don't have to give me your credit cards or anything. All you have to do is, when I, when I raise my hand like this, you would say Mandela. So let me, let's rehearse. It's been a long day, I know, but that's terribly bad. <laughs> okay, so, when, you know why? Because when you say that word, I can read the stanza. You only have to do it three times, and then you can go home. No, no, you can, then you're off the hook. Okay, so. <laughs> great, okay. So we'll, we'll start now, okay? So you, when, when you start, you say the word, I can give you the stanza. You say the word, give you the stanza, and there's only three and a half stanzas, so three times. Ready? made me believe in a salmon's waterfall climb. Grizzly claws and jaws dodge and spawn where so many salmon spawn before. <laughs> made me see the toot in toots and the maytals. When I and I seen enough for two lifetimes and the scales, the weighted scales fell 
from my eyes. Amen. Made me taste the just injustice. In coconut water offered lukewarm in the green nut, which his cutlass cracked in two while he held it, and I scraped jelly using a spoon carved by him from the husk of the nut. You touched me, and I had no idea until it dawned on me that your bony forearm draped my shoulders, radius and ulna no heavier than scentless orange sun, a messenger's son chasing me on my morning run. Thank you, Fred. Thank you. The wonderful Fred Degas. So you may have seen Shivani Ramnachan not just as a member of the Bocas Festival, um, an important member of the team. She's also a wonderful poet, um, and you would have experienced her, some of you who were at the earlier event. So we're going to invite her again in a different guise. Um, this time, the suggestion of Juve and Carnival. So I'd like you to give a very warm welcome to Shivani Ramnachan. I promise this is not the Shivani festival. This is the last time you will see me on this stage tonight. Oh, thank you. Somebody said something really sweet up here. Um, <clears throat> I've been very proud to be a part of the Bocas Lit Fest family since it began. It's been 12 years of working with committed, passionate, irrepressible people, and it's profoundly impacted me as a person and as a writer. I don't think this book would exist without my Bocas family. So Marina and Nicholas and everyone else on the Bocas team, I love you very much. <laughs> Who has been to Trinidad Carnival? Who has been to specifically Juve? That somehow seemed like more hands, which might... <laughs> But you know what, fair enough. Um, this poem is about Juve and all the spirits that attend us, living and dead, when we cover our bodies in paint and other various substances and remind ourselves that we are all free people. All the dead, all the living. At Juve, it doesn't matter if you play yourself or somebody else. Play your dead 80-year-old granny who had tongue like scorpion pepper, two foot like twin fishtail in Cora River, a smile like a butter knife cutting through hot sada. Play your living mother who made of more parts glitter than flour, who teach you softness have more than enough space to leave a cutlass waiting, glistening between fat folds, ready to chop you from a bed of ample waste. Play all the dead and all the living in you, in your short pants, in your bad on drawers, in your ragged fishnets and curry gold batty riders, in your half top in your no top, breasts swinging under electric tape nipples, panty forgotten in a culvert overflowing with holy water and hell liquor, your own perspiration sliding between bodies at play like the wetness from your body is purgatory unction. Play yourself, clay yourself, Wine on point and wine to the four stations of the cross, Dutty Angel, Bragadang Bad Thing, St. James Sukuya, Deep Bush Dwen come to town to make a killing in mud, and mother in law on fresh doubles after. Play like you were playing in your public servant office on Ash Wednesday calves aching and twitching in sensible slingback heels, 
a pulse in your lower back blossoming each time you bend down to file the papers, salute a clock, say grace before ashes. You know where you are, really. Just how you know the clock is a chantwell, the office is a concrete antechamber before the final mass, the pavement is a bus head convergence, the parking lot is a guile, the savannah is an arena where paint and a beer might wash, but spirit does linger. You are waiting till next year. Where you plant yourself this juve is where your spectral midnight lager who rattle in she coffin, turn in wolf to woman to wolf again. Thank you.
Okay. So please, please, let's give a warm, warm welcome for the return of John Agard. Okay. Now, back in the um, poets are inspired by very various genres, influences. You can think, for example, of um, Linton Kwesi Johnson and Gene Binterbreeze exploring reggae. You can think of um, a big hand. Yeah. A poet like John Cooper Clark exploring punk. Even as a little boy, I was always fascinated by the sound of the calypso, even if your mother tell you she'll box your mouth. So at eight years old, going to a Roman Catholic Jesuit school, not ever thinking I'll be a poet, I was fascinated by that sound, making love one day with a gal they call in Mimi. I pick up Mimi by the railway. One might intellectualize and say it's macho and sexist, etc. But at that time, in the ears of a nine-year-old boy, what I was responding to was the incantation of syllables. And my work resonates with the satirical impulse of the, of the Calypsonian, who can be body and political in one breath. And in the 80s, I coined an expression, poet Sonian. I'm not a Calypsonian by any means, but poet Sonian. So I could read some of the stanzas, but intersperse Calypso chorus. And I hope we'll all, when I come to the chorus, join in, and Randolph will surprise me. To learn how this thing, diversity, does operate. I went by Brixton Market to investigate how the fruit and veg them does integrate. I saw apple and mango conversing cozily. Ripe planting had no quarrel with broccoli. Aubergine don't bear grudge against Piri Piri. I was impressed how pineapple spoke sweetly. And when red pepper responded discreetly, I knew the fruit and veg them could teach a nation the secret of harmonious cohabitation. So if you want to learn about this thing, diversity, observe butternut squash <laughs> and the little lychee. In the fruit and veg market, it was plain to see the red, yellow, purple, and green live in harmony. The fruit and veg them show each other respect. Cucumber never raise a finger to courget. Now, let me hear you join in that chorus, line by line. Let me hear you suck it to the, to, 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 as we leave this premises. In the fruit and veg them market, it was plain to see. It was plain to see. The red, yellow, purple, and green. The red, yellow, purple, and green. Live in harmony. Live in harmony. The fruit and veg them show each other respect. The fruit and veg them show each other respect. Cucumber never raise a finger to courget. To come back, never raise a finger to call you. Then I saw salt fish <laughs> chatting up chorizo. <laughs> like the two of them that talk the same lingo. Gammon and mackerel held no grievance. Black pudding and salami struck up alliance. So if you want to learn about social etiquette, study the ways 
of the oxtail, the veal, the brisket. In the fish and meat market, it was plain to see. The black, white, pink, and brown live in harmony. The fish and meat them show each other respect. I never see a fight between two fillets yet. Now, let me hear you, line by line. In the fish and meat market, it was plain to see. It was plain to see. The black, white, pink, and brown. The black, white, pink, and brown. Live in harmony. Live in harmony. The fish and meat them show each other respect. The fish and meat them show each other respect. I never see a fight between two fillets yet. I never see a fight between. I never see a fight between two fillets yet. I never seen a fight between two fillets. Fillet Thank you very much. Long live Bocas. Long live Bocas. Give it up for John Agard, and I'd like to welcome back all the artists you've just seen. So we welcome back Grace Nichols, so thank you. Grace Nichols, Fred Degar, Shivani Ramlachan, John Agard, Randolph Matthews, and I'm Melanie Abrahams. Come on here, go. Go on here. Give yourselves a big round of applause. Let me tell you a secret. Books need to sleep at night, otherwise they don't wake up the next morning. So the, the books in the British Library need to go to sleep, so they're gonna kick us out very soon. But there are lots of bars and pubs around King's Cross in Pancras, I'm told. If anyone wants a party, to go out, go out and find a new local pub. Everyone, thank you so much for coming. Thank you to the writers. Thank you, British Library. Thank you, Renaissance One. Thank you, audience. Good night. See you next time. <laughs> <laughs>